Well, hello and welcome back to another one of our interview series. I've got with me today, Julie Verner, who's a clinical psychologist in Glendora, California. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks for coming. So Julie helps uh, families to see opportunities for growth and transformation in spite of the pain that families face when they find themselves struggling in their important relationships. Through compassion and understanding, Julie is committed to helping individuals, couples, and families in turbulent times find their way back to hope, healing, and a new life. Interestingly, in Julie's previous career, she was a children's pastor, which I found out earlier. We have Julie with us today to continue our theme of building resilience in families and children. Today, our focus is on the importance of giving children the opportunity to get their feelings out. Let's get started. So I understand, Julie, that you're, the focus of your clinical work is on working with adults with the intention that you want to help them to create a better space for their children to be resilient. Can you tell us a little bit about this and in particular focusing on why it's important for parents to reach out to get the tools to help their children to become resilient? Sure, sure. So I think probably fundamental to my approach to wanting to work with families is is really a growth mindset. Um, And Mm -hmm. in particular, given that I do a lot of work with families when they're going through Um, divorce, separation, Um, there is a sense that um, it can just be a place for a lot of discouragement. There can be feelings of failure, um, feeling like, you know, things didn't turn out the way they thought they would. And and so I think resourcing parents is a a way of saying, um, we, we have the whole kind of rest of life ahead of us. We have future in front of us and people grow. And really, I think there's a fundamental belief that hardship can do good work, that when we learn the lessons um, of life, whatever life brings our way, that we always have the opportunity to do better, to be better, and to benefit from things that kind of strip us down. So um, ultimately, I think there's just a belief that I believe for my clients and for the families that I work with, that they can experience more and that this is not the final word for them. So um, I think, did that answer your question? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when I talk about the work that I do with my clients, um, I describe it similarly, a little bit different, but I always say I work with really good people who are in a really difficult spot. And so, you know, on the on the family law end, we end up with people that are, come to our office, they're very angry or they're very uh, downtrodden or they're sad or they're all, they've got all these different emotions. And I always say, I can see through that because I see the good in people and my job is to help them to learn learn the skills and have the tools to become resilient. And so it sounds like we do a lot of the same work where we work to resilience build for our clients. Yeah. And to hold hope. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the benefit of the work that we do is we walk through these seasons with families and we see them at the beginning and then we see them when they um, grow and learn and heal and recover. And so even though maybe the parents or the families that we first meet may not feel very hopeful. I think we can hold hope for them because we've been in this place with other families before and we've seen things get better. And I think to have someone uh, walk alongside you and, and say, I wholeheartedly believe that there is good to be experienced, that there is healing to be had and there is a new day coming. I think that's just a, mm-hmm. a gift that Um, we can give families and and it feels so important. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about um, the importance of um, reaching out for that help? Because some families may, you know, they may think, okay, well, I I feel like I have to hire a lawyer because I've got these legal troubles, these legal issues. Um, But, you know, I, I don't have enough money or the resources or I don't want to deal with the emotions. So, you know, I'll I'll do it myself or, or that sort of thing. So what's the importance? What do you find with with families who choose to reach out and um, why would you encourage them to reach out? What what um, how how can that help? 
Well, I think, I mean, I firmly believe that reaching out is not an indication of deficiency. Reaching Mm -hmm. out is an indication of courage um, and uh, just, uh, I think it takes a lot of strength to be willing to go outside yourself. It's safe if you don't reach out because you don't have to think about what if I try and I fail? What do they think about me? I think tolerating Mm -hmm. that feeling of exposure or what you might learn initially, it's so scary, but I, I think that's one of the things that I find so valuable in the work that I do is that's a very common fear. Of course, that's shame, right? We don't want to be exposed. We don't want people to think that we are um, not capable or competent or that we've made bad mistakes. And um, I think what I love seeing over and over again is people discovering that their responses Mm -hmm. are normal, their fears are normal, um, these circumstances are hard. And so Mm -hmm. I think what, what I would want to encourage people to um, know or um, understand is that it, it's normal to feel afraid, um, but but getting help is not a sign of deficiency. It's really, that's what people who want to grow and learn and have courage do. And, and I think, especially when you're looking at issues of divorce or separation or you know, I may work with divorcing families all the time. Most of the families I work with, they may have never gone through this before. So this is not realistic for you to think that you know how to do this, that you know what the pitfalls are, that you know what your children need, that you know um, what a you know good parenting plan is going. You, you don't yeah. know. You have not done this before, and so to invite people into your journey with you, so that you can do it in a skilled, child-centered, growth-promoting way. I, I just think the consequences are very high, and so if you mm-hmm. choose not to resource yourself, I don't think it's realistic to expect that you will get the best possible outcome. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about um, you, you, we were talking earlier about how a lot of your work is with adults, mm-hmm. um, as the conduit to the children. And so your, your work isn't necessarily as uh, frequently directly with children, but um, part of your uh, passion, as I've understood it is um, to have to help the parents in yeah. who will then uh, be a conduit to helping the children. And when we were talking earlier, you were, you were talking about the, um, you know, in relation to your history of working with children as a children's pastor and how that has um, brought to fruition your passion of working with the adults um, going through the separation and divorce. Can you tell us a little bit about that conduit uh, piece? Sure, sure. So I was a children's pastor. That was my first kind of brief career. Um, (laughs) And then I also dated teaching a little bit. So I was a substitute teacher for elementary school for a period Mm -hmm. of time, kind of trying to see if that was something that I would be interested in doing. And I think at the heart of all of it is I just I love little people. They're just (laughs) precious to me. The the newness, the curiosity, the um just so much life is ahead. I love, I love kids. I really They're do. They're sponges, right? They just yeah. learn so much and so fast. And yes. Yeah. So they're just, I love kids. And, and so I think I was trying to kind of angle, how can I help kids? I want kids to turn out well, and I want them to be happy and healthy and have a good life. And what I found is that really anything I did as a children's pastor, anything I did as a substitute teacher or a babysitter or whatever it was, it was like a drop in the bucket at best to the lives they were living at home with their family. That, that is where life was happening for them. And so um, really what I found is that this is nice, but I, I just, I needed to get at it. That's kind of how I felt. I was like, I got to get at it. And so um, I decided to go back to school um, to earn my PhD in clinical psychology. Um, I actually went back to school as a parent. So I started graduate school with an 18 month old and then had more kids along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I... I knew how hard parenting was um, and I knew how badly I wanted to do a good job and how 
often I felt really empty handed. It's, it's hard. It's not easy. Even under um, kind of normative circumstances, being a parent is very hard. Um, and yet it is the most profoundly important um, aspect, I believe, of a child's life is, is that home that they're being raised in. And so that's really where I decided, you know, I have a luxury. I'm simultaneously raising my babies and I'm studying psychology. So I'm going to take advantage of this on behalf of other parents and throw myself into this from a really integrated standpoint. So I'm going to continue to wrestle through the tantrums and wrestle through all the things that come up in raising <laughs> my own kids. And then I'm going to orient my clinical work and my research around um, really how do we help these kids. So I did all my master's thesis, my dissertation, we're all, um, you know, parenting behaviors that promote academic achievement, you know, all looking at how parent the things that parents do mm -hmm. um, promote positive developmental outcomes for children. And really, my goal was, um, I want to take this thing that I'm getting to do, which is studying, and I want to do it on behalf of the parents who can't be here, but really need this help. And, and, and one of the things I found too, is that you can pick up books and it's like, for reals, one book says this, and then the other book will tell you the exact opposite, yes. right? And, and it's like, that's a parent. That's what like, the heck? yeah, it's crazy making. I didn't know, should I like, you know, really orient around the attachment or do I need to make sure that there's structure or, you know, what do I do with these <laughs> different philosophies and approaches? Yeah. And so, um, absolutely. I kind of decided that what I wanted to do was try to, um, create a shortcut for parents. So you don't have to go to graduate school, but I'm going to learn as best as I can. And I'm going to translate in such a way that you can feel confident, um, that you can have some tools for sorting through conflicting advice that makes you feel unconfident um, and just try to be a place of resource. And I really believe that that is, um, you know, to the degree that you can get into a child's environment, that I, I think that's mm -hmm. profoundly beneficial. Yeah. Well, interestingly, let's, uh, that leads us right into our next part, which is talking about this wonderful book that you wrote. So I'm going to put it up for everyone right now. So it's called The Incredible Shrinking Girl, A Divorce Story. And, uh, you know, uh, I would love if you could give our audience a little glimpse of the book and the importance about the book and the messaging. And as you were, I think it really carries on from what you're talking, you were talking about a moment ago, where this is a way to have parents be able to help their children as they go through the, the as the children go through their feelings around separation and divorce. Yes, yes, yes. So the book is about a little girl named Penny. Mm -hmm. And Penny wakes up one morning and discovers that she has begun to shrink. And so the book kind of goes through a few different anecdotes of not being able to have her feet reach the pedals, waking up and she's kind of shrunk down into the bed and the pillows up high, um, trying to rinse her dishes and she can't reach the faucet. So all these things are happening and she's confused because her clothes are too big. She's physically begun to shrink. And the one thing that she notices is that she began to shrink when she had learned of her parents' divorce. So she goes to school tiny, hoping no one will notice. And of course her kind teacher notices and asks her to stay in at recess and asks her about what's been going on. And in the story, as it unfolds, as Penny begins to talk about her experience and her feelings around her parents' separation, um, she begins to grow. And um, her feet pop out of her shoes and her clothes begin to tear. It's this, you know, empowering growing moment. And, and really the messaging in the book is that when we hold our feelings and thoughts inside that we can feel very small. And when we share our thoughts and feelings to um, safe ears and kind eyes that we can grow big and strong. And the idea really, I think fundamentally is that children's story, this is what I wanted them to know your story is, is uniquely yours. So mm -hmm. when, when a child's going through divorce, there's so much going on and so many big, big stories and big feelings, right. Mm -hmm. And their parents are having all these changes and there's crisis and, you know, all the things that go on in with the adults in their life. 
um, children are, they're intuitive, they're sensitive, um, and they're vulnerable. And so it's very easy for them to begin to adopt the story of those around them and, and to the neglect of really what's going on with them, what they need. And I think even as a parent, it's very difficult when our feelings are big to really attune to in an authentic way, the feelings that our children are having. Um, I had a incident the other day at my son's baseball game where he didn't get to play a lot and the positions he got weren't very good. And I was watching it and it was like, I'm having all these really big feelings. This is a train wreck. This is, I know he was so excited and why aren't they playing him more? And, and, and as I'm watching the game, I was so aware that I need to really make sure that when I meet him after this game, I don't meet him with my reaction and my feelings that I layer on him, but that I can be really quiet and attuned because he's had an experience and it may be like mine. It may not be. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're going through a divorce, it's like if you're disappointed in the other parent and you see that at all in your child, it's like you think their disappointment is the same as your disappointment. And, and so this idea of creating a lot of space for a child to tell their own story, one that's not using the language of their parents, you know, the other parent didn't leave us, they left the other parent, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so really creating a space for kids to tell their own story and one that is based on their thoughts, their feelings, their experiences. I think even as parents, we can um, be really developmentally inappropriate in the sense that we have our own experience of jealousy or our need for equity or, you know, and the kid may be just wondering, like, what kind of comforter will I have at the other parent's house? Because, you know, my bed is here and, and I have a car's blanket. And, you know, it's like, they may not, they are not, I can guarantee you, they're not thinking about the things that you're thinking about. So mm -hmm. really the, the point of the story is let's help kids know that their story is not the same as yours and that they need to tell it. And then, you know, as I, the way I think about a book is one therapy is expensive. And so if we can take professional sound, professional advice and put it in the hands of a child for $15, it, it can offer benefit. So I think just the accessibility of a book as opposed to um, some of the other things that they may or may not be able to have at the time of their parents' divorce. Um, and then my fantasy is that parents are reading the book to their children. And so when I'm talking to the children, I'm, I'm talking to the parents. And, and I do believe that parents, this is where they want to be. We're mm -hmm. not talking about bad parents who are wrapped up in their own situation. We're talking about parents who are experiencing pain, yeah. stress, disappointment, and, and, and it's so loud that it can interfere with their ability to tune into their children the way that they want to. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I don't view the parents as these incorrigible enemies. <laughs> I view the parents as loving the snot out of their kids and trying to juggle adjustment and pain alongside attunement. And that's a really big ask. It's a really big ask. So if putting a story with a, a hopefully kind of a playful narrative in the hands of the parents just serves as a a gentle reminder, a tool to help them think about what their children need. Um, I feel really, really pleased if, if that's what happens. Yeah, I I want to um, pick one particular page out of the book and read it if you're okay with that. Um, this is when um, Mrs. Bennett, who's the teacher who explains to Penny that um, uh, you know, she can have her own story. And um, I picked this page in particular, because um, before I, I, I do um, a lot of uh, different things around kids stuff. And so I always test things out on my children. And so I had my children read this book. And this was the page that my nine year old picked out as his uh, I just asked, you know, what the impact was on you when you read this, when you read this book, and he says, Mom, I have to read you this page. And so I thought it, it was impactful for my nine year old. And I thought, you know, it would be impactful for our viewers as well. So this is, um, says, uh, Mrs. Bennett explained to Penny, when your parents decide that they couldn't be married anymore, it was an adult decision uh, for adult reasons. That is their divorce story. She continued, but you have a divorce story too. It's about your thoughts and feelings. 
and the changes that happen to you when you're when you keep your story inside you start to feel very small but when you share your story to safe ears and kind eyes you grow very strong and so that was just um very impactful um it it describes the difference of course around um you know going from really little to really big and the impact of that and so to me that was uh, such a beautiful part of the story Oh, thank you. Yeah. So we we do have um, your a link to your book for um, Amazon Canada and the US uh, right underneath this interview, as well as um, a, uh, in our book library for anyone who would like to go and check that out, um, uh, Julie's book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the inspiration was for your for writing the book? Yeah, I think um, just in working with families, I, I think it, it was a, an expression of my empathy. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes children, they just felt like they were becoming invisible. Um, you know, some of the issues that were being argued over, I just felt like, you know, this isn't really about them. You know, if we're talking about percentage of parenting time and, and someone's saying, well, I have 60%, you know, it, it was like it was more about their kind of legitimacy as a parent rather than mm -hmm. a, a kind of child-centered statement about what their child needed. And, and I understand, I understand this is such a difficult, painful process, but when the feelings get big and the kids start feeling invisible, um, it's just sad. It was, it was just mm -hmm. sad. And so I started trying to think about like, I tend to think in images. And so it was like, what is this feeling? You know, what would be the image? And it was really, I thought of shrinking. I thought of invisibility. Um, and, and so it was, yeah, just, I think seeing kids and feeling like really what's going on for them and what they need was getting missed. Um, and so I wanted to image that in a way that would um, kind of bring the focus back on them Mm -hmm. if I you know, interestingly, we talked a little bit about um, how uh, it, this would be a, this book um, is an important way for parents to start that dialogue with their children about the importance of uh, bringing their story out and that they have feelings and they need to, to talk about those feelings. Um, and, you know, uh, wh one of the things I wonder if you could comment on is the importance of creating a space for children to talk about their feelings. And when I say that, it's in the context of very often when, you know, parents will talk to their children about the divorce, the fact that the divorce is happening, they'll, they'll tell their kids. Um, and then some kids will open up to their parents and there's some kids that really won't. They'll uh, go inward. Uh, they won't talk a lot. And, you know, the, the I'd like to hear your comments on the importance of doing whatever possible to get uh, those feelings out, whether it's to the parents or to another trusted adult. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, I think because kids are so intuitive, um, they always know way more than we think that they do. Um, and, and so sometimes it is very hard for them to get away from this sense of loyalty conflicts, um, it, it's hard for them to be able to talk to a parent about how they feel without kind of monitoring it for something that would be hurtful to their parents yeah. or suggest an alliance. So there really are even a very um, intentional parent. Um, it, it's not an indictment against the parent if the child won't talk. I think mm -hmm. it's important to say that. Um, and so I, it, it's not really a matter of um, will they talk to you or not? And and this is some sort of, you know, you're doing a good job or you're not doing a good job. It's just about they need to be able to talk. And if you find that they seem kind of buttoned up around you, I think it's really important to facilitate other spaces for them to talk. Even if they're talking a lot, you they may be telling you what they think you'll want to hear. You know, so I, I think there's, you can't underestimate this idea of a neutral space. Um, and so whether that's a therapist or if you have a family member that is kind of objective and 
not viewed as on a team or, you know, by the child, but finding someone where they really can talk about their experience um, without uh, feeling any sense of obligation or duty to anybody in their narrative. I think that's really important. You know, that's interesting because again, with my children as guinea pigs, as I ask them their perspective, I mean, they're, you know, eight, eight, uh, nine, 10 and 11, but they, they have an amazing perspective that they can uh, share with me as a divorce professional. And so I'll share one more thing. So my daughter um, uh, was able to, to say, uh, she was talking about the importance of, of she used the word uh, trusted adult. And I think that's probably the language that they use in the, in, in the schools. And um and so uh, she says it's really important to be able to have that, um, you know, a, a, a opportunity to speak with a trusted adult. And I said, well, you know, what's the importance of that? And and her reflection was that, you know, sometimes parents can be involved in their own issues, their own emotions, and unintentionally they don't have that space to carry their children's emotions as well. And so it's helpful if they don't, they don't, um, you know, she describes, she doesn't want to feel like she's burdening, you know, a parent or something. And so to know that you can have that separate space with a separate person um, you describe about, you know, not feeling like they have a loyalty bind when they're talking, but also that they know that that person has the space to, uh, to talk with them. Yeah. And I thought that was a really important perspective. It is. It is. I remember when I was um, a younger parent and because I was I was going to figure it out. That was kind of my approach. Mm-hmm. And I remember I actually made a report card for my kids to fill out. <laughs> about Because oh, <uh-oh>. <laughs> I wanted to understand. And, you know, they were sweet and they told me what I wanted to hear. Right. And and our kids, they are sweet and and they do know what makes us feel good. And so I I just think it is important to be realistic about the limitations that that Mm -hmm. may pose and just the freedom that can be found, even being in a different physical space. You go to this office, it's not your home. There's nothing, you know, in terms of kids who have the opportunity to participate in therapy, this is obviously kind of as we're recovering from COVID, we're not entirely there yet. But mm-hmm. I do think even having a different physical space, whether it's a trusted adult, you're going to, um, you know, you have a mentor that takes you out for ice cream, or mm-hmm. you're involved in your church, or you um, have a relative that, you know, takes you places, but just getting in a neutral physical space, being with someone that you are not going to feel any kind of um, caretaking burden for. Mm -hmm. um, I I just think that that is unique. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, and it's so important. Um, The idea of uh, children going to counseling um, comes up quite often uh, in divorce negotiations. And, you know, I often experience where one uh, one of the parents isn't as keen as maybe the other parent. One parent says, I really think that our kids need to go and, you know, get some help to, you know, have their feelings and talk about their feelings. And, um, you know, the other parents, you know, either isn't on side or says, no, our kids are fine. They don't need, you know, to talk. And that's a really difficult conversation to have. And I always, always will recommend that if we can have a space for your children to talk um, to a professional or to another, to a trusted adult, um, it can be so helpful um, to them. And it's not, again, it's, as you said, it's not evaluative of, you know, which parent is better or uh, which parent should have more um, time with the children or more decision-making responsibilities. It's all about having that opportunity for your children to have space to become resilient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think to to really try to move away from a pathological framing of this, this is not saying there's something the matter with your child or you've harmed nice. your child or that's not what we're saying. It's like getting your teeth cleaned, right? We have mm-hmm. asked them to hold some things and let's help them kind of uh, metabolize that in a healthy way, you mm-hmm. know, so it doesn't become, you know, metaphorical tartar or whatever, you know, that they are. <laughs> talking about processing, acknowledging, and working through in a healthy way. It's, you know, I think you can really look at it from a a kind of preventative standpoint. It's not an indictment. It it is, let's help them do this in a supported, healthy way so that they walk out of this um, whole and healthy and, and in a good, 
space. You know, I love that. I love that analogy, uh, the preventative care uh, before something, before a problem gets so big that um, little Penny has to shrink down so that she has to brush her teeth. And in your book, of course, yeah. I'm referring to has to brush her teeth uh, with her, or brush her hair, excuse me, with her toothbrush. You know, it's just so wonderful. Um, so let's uh, get to our, my very favorite part of every interview, which is my top three tips. Okay. Um, so I'd like to hear your top three tips on helping uh, families to build resilience into homes. Okay, okay. So my first one is, and this is probably the most random one, but it's really, you are what you eat and who you are really matters, okay? So we're talking about mm -hmm. parents. This is the thing that makes me really sad. When I sit down with a parent and it's like the lights have gone out of their countenance. They are eating conflict and battle all the time. The first thing that comes out of their mouth is to orient around, recount, bemoan aspects of their divorce. And, and I think that it is so important that parents find ways to disengage from the conflict, to maintain hobbies, friendships, you know, eat your vegetables. Those are the healthy aspects of, um, being a healthy person, having mm -hmm. things in your life that you enjoy and allow you to feel good. Let go mm -hmm. of the conflict. It's like if you eat hamburgers and French fries three times a day, you will look like you eat hamburgers and French fries three times a day. And, and these parents, the fact that they wear in their mm -hmm. countenance fighting, it, it, that is not, your kids see that. That does not help you to be a good parent. So that that piece of self-care, of balance, of trying to set aside conflict and do things that are good for your for you, um, that that would be one of my probably biggest pieces of advice. And you know, the interesting thing, um, a lot of the the things you describe in there about divorce wellness and personal wellness during a divorce process, um, and uh, the people that sur you surround yourself with. Um, these are um, exactly the modules that I've got in our course at Up A Notch Learning, our foundational course, which is called Healthy Thriving Families 101. And it's got seven modules in it. And it's really designed for families who are just starting their separation process. And they might be looking to figure out, you know, how do I hire a professional? Who should I, you know, what kind of professional should I hire? What kind of process should I look at? But also things like, um, I have a module called the Spectator Gallery. And that one is about how do you surround yourself with so healthy and supportive people and even allowing you the opportunity to create your own definition of supportive and um, really uh, being able to, um, you know, be embody who you surround yourself with. So um, and then with the divorce wellness piece is really, you know, finding that hobby and surrounding yourself with uh, friends and uh, gratitude journals and, you know, these kind of things that can really yeah. create some uh, positive momentum as you engage in your journey, because it doesn't have to be a destructive journey. It can be a constructive journey, but that will take um, skills and tools. And that's really at Up A Notch Learning what we try to um, impart on people, which is part of this interview series and all these books that we've got and our book club and blogs and courses and and that sort of stuff is for families to be able to learn these tools because a lot of people haven't ever gone through the divorce process a separation or divorce process before and so our goal is to help them to to uh, build that resilience with these yeah. tools it is it is so so important I have a mom I'm working with and she had set a new year's resolution she was going to have flowers once a week in her home fresh flowers and mm -hmm. and more play and that is exactly the kinds of things that we're talking about. It's creating space to grow and, and heal and move on. What do you want your life to look like? Mm -hmm. and, and we can't spend our every waking day kind of with our eyes in the rearview mirror, um, kind of orienting around something that, that didn't work. We've got to begin to think about what do we want our new life to look like? Mm -hmm. Um, and that is the best thing. If you be happy and healthy, and, and that is one of the best things you can do for your yeah. kids. Yeah. And the, and uh, the first thing we start with happy and healthy parents, which can build happy and healthy children. 
Yeah. So let's hear tip number two. Okay. I made a note. So let me see what it was. Uh, Number two. Oh, uh, be discreet. So this is like I mentioned earlier, kids always know way more than parents think they do. (laughs) Yes. Um, So if I could just really hammer something in for parents, it would be, be like a thousand times more discreet than you're being right now. Um, You know, it's like, if you have a phone call and, and, you know, your kids are old enough, get in the car, go for a drive. Um, Kids. You think your kids are asleep. They're not. They're not. They are (laughs) not. And this is the thing. Kids become hyper vigilant when their life is changing like this, and they want to know about the things that are going to impact their lives. So they're they may act like they're doing homework, they may act like they're watching TV, they may act like they're they are so tuned in. And and I just think parents get too sloppy. You know, they talk to a friend, they take a phone call, they leave court papers out. Um, You need to allow your home to be the haven that it needs to be for your children and be so, 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 so discreet. Mm -hmm. I I just think that that is really, really, really important. You know, an interesting thing um, a client told me once that really impacted me is that their, uh, their children used to sleep with the door closed. Um, You know, that would be part of their routine, kiss you goodnight and uh, close your door. And as they were going through a separation, when there was conflict in the home or there was conflict on, on the phone, uh, the, the kids never didn't want their doors closed anymore. And, you know, the, it, it became all that much more difficult because of course, to be discreet, uh, it becomes more difficult when doors are open. Yeah. yeah. Well, that became very sure. difficult. Okay. Tip number one, let's hear it. Last okay. one. Last one. <laughs> oh, okay. This is the other one that I, I think is an important one. And, and this one is don't overprotect. I think that we, um, can overprotect our kids for a lot of reasons. Maybe we uh, feel guilty because of what they're having to go through. Maybe because the trust has been broken between us and the other parent. Um, But I really think that we need to think about this as really preparing our children to have the skills to take care of themselves. So for instance, if there's something going on at the other house, obviously we're not talking about major safety issues, but something that they don't like that's happening at the other parent's house, you know what? Okay, well, what do you think you would like your parent to know? How can you tell them? Um, Equipping them to ask for what they need. Um, Talking through what, you know, mommy, I'm gonna miss you okay, what can you do? What helps you feel better when you miss me? Do you like Mm -hmm. to have um, this teddy bear? Um, What about if before you go to bed, you look out the window and you look at the moon? Because you know what? The moon you see is the same moon I see at my house. But this idea of teaching them to ask for what they need, think about what helps them feel better, Um, When we try to coach the other parent and and get kind of what I would say is overprotective, um, we don't help them. We deprive them of a learning opportunity. We underestimate their abilities. And then we contribute to the conflict, which is the absolute worst thing that we could do for them. Mm -hmm. I've said if if your other parent were to, um, if we were to line up all the potential parent coaches for them in the entire world, Um, It put them in a line of like most preferred to least preferred. There is a very good chance that you would be at the very end of the line. You know, they don't want you telling them how to parent. They want to figure out how to do this, how they want to. (laughs) They want people helping them who are supportive of them, sympathetic to them, loyal to them. And so I, I do think that this idea of getting over involved and really um, underestimating what your kids can learn to do. um, Mm -hmm. It creates a lot, a lot of problems. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. And, you know, um, the, that often happens in, in, um, in my work with, you know, divorce negotiations or, you know, uh, um, I do a lot of mediation. And so, for example, if, if, um, if I say something, it will be heard, but if the, if the other spouse says, if the spouse says one spouse says something to the other, it doesn't get heard because they don't have those ears. They don't want to listen to the other spouse. And so um, trying to figure out ways to give your children the tools to be able to resolve things so that it doesn't cause the conflict to escalate, because that can be really hard if you're trying to give those um, ideas or those tips to the other parent, and then they don't, they don't want to listen to it. And then as you say, it's, it feels like coaching. Yeah. They don't, you're the last person they want to hear from. <laughs> they, they don't. And I think this is another piece where a, a child's therapist really can be helpful because it, it is very, I think it requires a fair amount of discernment to coach a child about how to interact with the other parent and not pollute it with what's going on for you. Um, and mm-hmm. so I think this is where, even if, you know, there's something that's going on to be able to tell the child's therapist, you know, they, um, you know, don't like the food that their dad prepares or their mom prepares, whatever the issue is. Um, can you coach them through how to talk to their parent and ask for what they need? Um, mm-hmm. And then that can create a little more neutral, safe space. Um, and then the child even can maybe receive in a different way because um, it's definitely tricky to kind of take on that role in a way that is safe for the child and, and not um, kind of impacted by your own perception yeah. and your own pain. Um, yeah. Kind of, we're always going to kind of, I don't know, always, but often we really underestimate the other parent and tend to um, see them according to our own pain, disappointment, um, the ways that they weren't who we wanted them to be. It's very hard to not do that. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I I think that overprotecting piece creates just loads Mm -hmm. and loads and loads of problems and kids can just do so much more than we give them credit for. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. As my children always say, mom, you're teaching us independence. Yes, that's how I was raised. And that's how I'm going to, I'm going to teach you as well as to teach you to be independent and to learn these kind of things. So um, Julie, I really appreciate uh, you joining us today and our viewers um, are, are going to get so much out of um, being able to listen to um, all of your advice. And once again, I'll put up your, uh, your book. um, And remember, there's a link to it right under the video. And it's also in our book club. So I encourage you to check it out. And thanks again so much for joining us, Julie. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for everything that you're doing. I think we, we need good, positive, supportive voices to help families get from point A to point B in a way that is constructive and and healthy. And so I so value the work that you're doing. And so thank you. Thank you. And you know, it's wonderful, because there's so many experts worldwide. And our goal at Up A Notch Learning is to have all of them, as many as possible, um, contribute their little piece of expertise into our community, because um, it's really about skill building for families. And all of these little nuggets that families can take, whether they read, listen to the entire interview, or they listen to a little chunk of it, or they uh, do a few things here and there within our portal. Um, We're always so pleased that uh, we can contribute to some positive and constructive information. As, um, as you say, as they're getting all sorts of conflicting uh, information out there, um, we hope that uh, the one thing that is consistent within our platform is positive and constructive only information. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So thanks again so much. And we'll see you again soon, Julie. Sounds good. Thank you.